Hello, this is Allie with The Perception Trainers, author of The Perception Diet, and today I have a nice long video for you about do we really need fear in order to survive and to thrive and to evolve. We're going to talk about 5D and expanding consciousness. We're going to talk about evolution, growth, change. We're going to talk about the ego. We're going to talk about all of these awesome um, and very misunderstood concepts that are kind of floating around in the world today. And we're going to look at a lot of spiritual teachings that for a very long time have been very esoteric and very intellectual and heady. And we're going to say these things are really only as useful as they are practical. And I wanted to make this video mostly because there is so much confusion out there in the in the spiritual world in the light working world in the in the evolution of consciousness world and i wanted to give some clear concrete advice and tools and insights that are practical and reasonable and not so airy fairy and not so esoteric and the reason that I want to do this okay and so if you don't want to watch this whole video I'm going to sum it up my point up for you right here right now the reason is this evolution from the point at which we are in our human consciousness the next step of evolution that we need to take is becoming personally responsible okay we are here to embrace the individual that we are, to truly own and accept the ego that is us, and to understand that ego is not something we, that is making us jealous and making us uh, go to war and, and all these things that we've listed that ego, all the horrible things that we've made ego be. It's the reason we're in pain. It's the reason we can't love ourselves. It's, all, it's, all, it's the thing that makes you different and that's a bad thing. That truly, that's, that's not at all what the ego is, okay? That the ego is simply, simply the aspect of the divine that you represent. And that being in your ego does not disconnect you from the whole, but in fact, the more you know yourself, the more you know the whole, because this is how unity works. The more you're cutting yourself off from you, the more you're cutting yourself off from everything. And we're going to get into this and I'm going to talk about this, but as I say, the whole point of waking up, the whole point, the whole thing of moving to 5D consciousness, the whole idea of getting rid of fear and stepping into love and all of these esoteric, lovely sounding ideas is, it's actually very practical. It's, it, we don't need aliens to tell us how to do it. We don't need to channel. We don't need our higher selves. We don't need any of that. It's, it's truly a matter of taking responsibility for yourself and learning what that really means. And so I wanted to talk today about fear specifically first. We're going to talk about why fear has never been the tool that we have used to move forward and why fear is not a good tactic for trying to wake people up and and we're going to talk about the truth of fear and the roots of fear and why people still think holding on to fear is a good thing and why we still kind of need fear and why fear has served us and we're going to look at that and I'm going to give you a maybe a different perspective than you've ever heard so that you can understand what it actually means to live in a state of love. So again, taking this kind of esoteric concept and making it very practical and very, this is just what it looks like. It's not airy fairy. It's not a feeling. It's practical. It's reasonable. It's something you can do. You can look and see that is love. That is not. Second thing is we're going to look at why fear is not like I say, the motivator for expansion. That when, if we're calling ourselves and we're wanting to move into 5D or to the next earth or to the whatever you want to call it, that, that it is not fear that's going to get you there and that it's taking responsibility for yourself that's going to get you there. And we're going to talk about 
human evolution and how it has all unfolded up till this point and what we can learn from that. Because this is a huge part of growing up is knowing your history and knowing how that is affecting you now and what your choices are within that, okay? So this is gonna be a long one and this is actually part four in a blog series that I've written about 5D consciousness and moving up in our consciousness level. So I've linked that down below. And because this is so long, I've also linked my friend Kim's recipe website down below, Best of Vegan. And so pause this video, go make yourself a vegan snack, uh, and then come back when you're, when you're done making your snack. Cause this is gonna be long and I, and I want you to hang out for the whole time and so Hopefully you have something that will keep you occupied or if you can just pay attention, that's great too. I know our attention spans aren't so awesome, but hey, whatever it takes, right? Go make a snack, have some coloring book, do whatever you need to do so you can listen to this whole thing. And the other two links that I've put down below are links to videos that explain the concept, the map of human evolution that was developed by a man called Claire Graves and Spiral Dynamics has then, uh, so a company called Spiral Dynamics has expanded upon it and these two videos that I posted down below give you a good overview of the system that they've talked about because part of what we're going to talk about today is going to be based on that information loosely so if you can go and watch those videos afterwards I think you'll really enjoy them. Um, again it's just a really cool way of looking at human evolution in the macro and the micro like seeing how how each individual goes through each phase that they talk about but also consciousness as a whole goes through each phase that they've talked about so the point of this video is going to be how do you grow up how do you step into a state of love how do you become the next evolution how do you fully understand who you are so that you can live that on the planet. How do you help us avoid wiping out the human or the, the human race and become someone who's working towards life? All right. This, that's what this video is about. And so, and again, this is not esoteric and this is not idealistic. This is all practical because it needs to be practical. If your spiritual practices and your spiritual understandings and the things that you're going through and the people you're listening to aren't helping you change your life so that you become more of a responsible human being, then I would call it false spirituality. I would call that superstition, okay? And we're going to get into that. But so I'm not really into teaching that stuff. I'm into teaching what's reasonable, what's practical, what's logical. If it's a true spiritual teaching, it has practical implication. And if it's a fake spiritual teaching, it won't. So that's what we're doing. That's the point of this video is how do we grow up? How do you become a part of the society that we want to create? Okay, so that's what this is. So the first thing that we want to look at is our definition of love, right? So when we say we want to be love, we say we want to evolve, we say we want to get rid of fear and become love and all these things, what are we really talking about, all right? Love is simply the addition of information, all right? That is really the basis, foundation, definition of love that, that you need to understand to get the rest of this video, okay? Love is the addition of the information that is needed for the next stage of evolution or growth. So when we look at love, love is added energy. Love is added information. Love is something being added to something that already exists. That's what love is. So when people say that love is the most powerful force in the universe, that's a misnomer. Love is the only force in the universe. There is only love or absence of love. There is only information or absence of information. There is only energy or absence of energy, force or absence of force. You see, we, 
we have varying degrees of energy, varying degrees of force, varying degrees of information, but they are all higher or lower than whatever it is that's above and below them. There is no such thing as a negative force. There's no such thing as darkness, right? You can't turn on a darkness switch. You just have to block the light. You can't turn on a cold switch. You have to reduce the amount of heat energy. Yes, love is that which is required to stimulate growth. Growth means I need more information, more energy, more knowledge, more something in order to become something more complex than what I am. You see, growth is simply going from something less complex to something more complex, something less ordered to something more ordered, something less structured to something more structured something less intelligent to something more intelligent. That's what evolution is. That's what growth is. So love is simply the information that is required at this time to be added to whatever it is that wants to grow and evolve so that it can get to its next state of growth or evolution. That's all love is. So love is both masculine and feminine. Love is reception and the giving energy, right? We need love in order to receive because it's, it's all one thing. Love is everything that is required for growth and expansion. All right, that's all that love is. And I do, I do, have, I do have notes, so that's what I'm looking at. Um, so to be in a state of love is to be in a state of growth and regeneration. So to understand, to be in a state of love does not mean you know everything. You don't have to have access to all information. You don't have to have more energy than is required for your next state of growth, okay? You just need what is required for your next step. That's all you need. To be in a state of love is to be in a state where you are receptive to the force that is going to cause you to evolve and then you are allowing that to evolve you. You are taking in the information and you are changing based on it. Yes, that's what being in a state of love is. I am receptive to the information. I understand I'm never complete. I'm always going to be moving, growing, changing, evolving. So I'm always taking in new information and changing based on that information. I am in a state of continual evolution. I am relaxed enough to take in new information. I am calm enough to understand that change does not mean I was wrong before. I am taking love in. I am evolving based on that love, information, order, complexity. I am becoming more ordered, more complex, more regenerative. Okay, I'm in a life cycle. That's what being in a state of love is. I'm not decaying, I'm growing. Yes? Okay. Fear is simply the lack of information, the lack of energy, the lack of whatever is required for growth to take place. That's all fear is. It is simply the lack of understanding, the lack of knowledge, the lack of information, the lack of energy, whatever it is that is required for growth to take place, not being there. All right, that's the easiest thing. That, so fear is not a thing in and of itself. Fear is not something we get rid of. We're not gonna conquer fear. We don't have to get rid of fear. It's an emptiness. All right, it's a lack of. Now, don't confuse fear with void. Not the same thing, okay? We are talking, so there is space within the universe, yeah? And within you, and with, there is the space, the container that holds the force. Both of those things are necessary, yeah? Where, where we find fear is where the stuff the not the space, the stuff that needs a force acting upon it in order to grow and evolve and expand is blocking that force. All right, not the same as void, not the same as space. Space is necessary. If we didn't have space, there could be no movement. Yeah, if we didn't have space, there could be no growth. It's not about no space. It's about the parts within you that are ready to grow and expand that are not receiving the energy, information, 
whatever it is that they need to grow and therefore causing a death cycle. Okay, so when we're in a state of fear, we are causing degeneration rather than regeneration because this is the law of life. This is the law of the universe that you occupy. There is either growth and expansion or there is death and decay. There is no in between. All right. And this is something that I feel like we need to really understand. All right. That this existence that we live in, if you really get this, if you understand this concept, life will be easy for you for the rest of your life. <laughs> that there is no stagnancy. That death and regeneration is the automatic response to anything that's not growing and evolving. All right? We know this in human biology. Your body is literally set up with a death cycle system for any cell that is no longer evolving. So if it's getting cut off from its nutrient supply, if it's mutated in some way, if there's something that's blocking it from evolving and becoming more structured, more complex, it is killed, dead, cut off. And it is like that in all, all areas, from the very, very, very tiniest little cell to the biggest of cultures. Yeah? Anything that's not evolving is automatically set into a death cycle to be recycled. Yeah? And we know this life is all cycles. Everything in this earth, it's cycles and cycles within cycles. So nothing that we're looking at right now that's happening is something that we can say, wow, that's never happened before. No, it's all happened before. It's all happened before in a different cycle. Yeah? So we can start to understand that if we observe the cycles, we observe how things have happened, we observe what's gone on before, we can see how it applies to now. Now is a little bit different, right? Now is an evolution on what we saw before, but it is not a completely separate thing. There's connection to everything, everything's a cycle. So we're either on a regenerative cycle, which is an evolution cycle, which is an information collecting cycle, which is becoming more ordered, more complex, more structured, yes, more intelligent, or we are devolving, going into a death cycle, so that our tissues literally go back to the earth, get recycled, try again. Anything that's not growing goes back to the earth to be recycled so that we can, it can be infused with new life and try again. And we see that literally as soon as that moment of death is the moment where new life begins. It's all a cycle. There is no end. There is no beginning. And you get to choose what cycle you're on. You get to choose if you're evolving and therefore on a life cycle or if you're devolving and therefore on a death cycle. That's what this is. Okay? So that's that. Now let's look at human history and how fear has played a role in our evolution and in our biology and why fear is not the motivator for change and evolution. And I mean, just listening to this definition, you probably can skip this whole big part if you don't, if you don't want to listen to all of it because you probably understand what I'm going to say, right? Clearly, fear, using fear as a tactic to scare people into evolving makes no sense now that you understand that fear is sourced from a lack of information. In order to scare someone, you have to collude them. You have to exclude information. You have to create a situation where things that should be known are not known. In order for there to be fear, there has to be unknowing. There has to be misunderstanding. There has to be lack of information. And that can never create growth. That's not where growth comes from. Growth comes from more information. So that's the first thing, yeah? Fear is never going to create growth. And now let's look at all of human history, everything we've been through up to this point, to look at how that it's actually functioning, okay? So in the very beginning, we have the brainstem, yes? This is the most primal part of the brain, the most basic of physiology. And we needed the brainstem and its evolution being the fear response, the stress response, that adrenaline response, 
in order to survive when we did not have the capacity to recognize patterns. That is the entire purpose of the brainstem and the adrenaline fear response. So the entire purpose of the brainstem was to create neural pathways and automatic physiological responses to stimuli that was seen as a threat to our survival that created automatic responses so that we could survive. So for instance, if you were out in the wild and you're running around and you see a lion, you don't have the capacity to understand that that's a lion, to understand that it wants to kill you, to understand that you should run away, to understand all these things. You don't have that. All you can do is try running away or try climbing a tree or try fighting it off with a stick. Okay? Impulse, impulse, impulse. That's wired into physiology, right? To fight or flee. Now, the reason that was developed and became a part of the survival thing was because it worked. Any other, any of the humans that tried doing something else that didn't run away, that didn't fight, that didn't climb the tree, got eaten. So that, that reaction didn't get passed on in the genes. Do you see what I'm saying here? So any species that was um, successful in surviving had one of these fight or flight reactions. It worked. They got it wired into their DNA. They got it wired into their body. So now every time they see a lion, they don't have pattern recognition. They don't have the ability to say, oh, last time I did this, so I should do it this time. It had to be neurochemical. Yeah? And then that got passed on because those were the successful people that didn't get eaten. Yes? And we see this in animals today. The animals that require the, the brainstem and their fear response, the fight or flight to survive, do not have the capacity to tell stories and make concepts and recognize pattern. Yeah? The antelope are not saying, we should eat somewhere else because this is where the lions are. They're just like, oh, food, 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 food. Oh, lion's coming. Run away because that's programmed into my, my biology, my physiology. It's an automatic reaction. And then once the lion is gone, they're not sitting there thinking about what would have happened if the lion had caught them. They're not sitting there thinking about what about the next time the lion comes. There is nothing about that going on. There's no stories. There's no concepts. There's no perception. It's just eating, fucking, running away. It's survival. That's all that is, okay? because they can't recognize patterns. Now, that's the very base of the human. We had that, we survived. Next evolution was pattern recognition. Our brains evolved, got bigger, had got more complex, more ordered, more structured. We were now newly capable of recognizing patterns and seeing things for how they worked. And making up concepts based on those patterns. That was a huge evolution. Going from just being essentially biochemistry, just don't survive or just don't die, to, okay, I can see now, every time a lion comes, the lion wants to eat me. So maybe I could develop some tools to fight off the lion instead of just running away. Because if I kill the lion, the lion can't come back. You see? So we develop, all of a sudden, this capacity for pattern recognition and within that we can create concepts and within that we can create solutions to problems. So right there, th at that point in our evolution, we actually move past the need for the adrenaline response. We did not need it anymore to survive because we could, we could conceptualize, theorize, plan and do something different. So that's right there in our human evolution when we evolved past the need for the brainstem and the adrenaline response. Now, here's how we know we evolved past it, okay? Because like we were talking about before, anything that's resisting evolution is in a destruction cycle. Anything that's resisting moving forward, love, more information, more order, more complexity, is now becoming decay, death, moving towards death, destruction. So when we look at the animals 
that don't have complex pattern recognition skills. We see they do not have stress-induced sicknesses. They don't get diseases from their stress. This is because their stress is momentary and then it's over. They are not, like I said, the antelope is not sitting there worrying about the lion coming back. They're not thinking about like, oh my gosh, what would have happened if they had eaten me? Oh no, no, no. maybe we shouldn't be here. I don't know. They're not doing that. They don't have any of that. They don't have any stories. They don't have any concepts. It's the, th the, the stressor happens, I react, and then if I survive, I shake it off and I'm done. That's it. No more adrenaline. They go back to being in a rest and digest state. Yes? Humans don't do this. Humans, when we use our fear response, usually, now, we're using it in a place where it has no practical application. We are not under physical threat. Most of us, all, like most of the time, we're not under physical threat. But even if we are, we don't need fear, adrenaline, automatic response, knee-jerk response to survive because we can do pattern recognition. What's happening is that now, rather than saying, okay, let go of that brainstem thing, evolve, understand, we don't need knee-jerk reaction, we don't need that fear response, that, right, that lack of information response, because we have higher reasoning and higher thinking, we're continuing to hold on to fear response with our capacity to tell stories and make concepts and do all these things. And rather than understanding that we are empowered through our capacity to tell stories and make concepts, we use them to disempower ourselves and we're seeing that we're giving ourselves stress-induced diseases. This is how we can tell we've evolved beyond it because if we really still needed that fear response to survive, it would not be detrimental to our health. That's not how growth works. Anything that is evolving us is good for us. Anything that is devolving us is showing us that you've evolved past this. You don't need this anymore. This is destructive. Yeah? We no longer need the fear adrenaline response to get us going because we have thinking. We have higher reasoning. And we are getting sick from using our stress response the adrenaline response that we evolved past many, 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 many thousands of years ago. Yes, we're getting sick from it now because we don't need it anymore. Okay, so we evolved into being able to do pattern recognition and that was really great and that was a step forward, right? That's more information, more complexity. And then we went from being just me out on my own trying to survive to noticing that when I work together with other people, yeah, when not everything is other anymore, because remember, way, way, way back then, it, everything was seen as the other. We were in the absolute childlike state that it is just me and everything is not me and this whole world is not me and it's gonna eat me and, and I can't survive. And then we started to notice that if we started to work together, we could survive better. Yeah? And this was the birth of tribal life. So we start to create these tiny little communities where we're noticing that if this person does the fishing and this person does the hunting and this person does the berry collecting and this person does the, the hut building, we actually have a better chance of surviving together. If we're all fighting the lion together, we have a better chance of surviving the lion. Like me and my three guys fighting the lion, it's way more successful than just me. So we advanced again into more order, more complexity in this idea of working together against everything still, but still working together a little bit. We're making a bit more room for a we rather than just me and everything else worked for us. Okay, so that was awesome. That was a step in the right direction. That every step that we've taken was a step in the right direction, but that was a step forward. The next thing that happened is leadership and hierarchy. So because consciousness at that time of the tribe was still very low, so we need to understand that tribal consciousness is still quite low, meaning there's still a lot about the, inf the environment, there's still about a lot about the earth, there's a lot about surviving that we don't understand. Yeah? 
there's still so much about the, the way the world works that is a mystery. The brain still hasn't caught up to how things work yet. So it's, it's a primitive understanding, yeah? And there's this very deep sense that the reality is scary, nature is scary, and we need to be protected from it. That there is this very deep sense of there being an other that's going to come and take my resources and hurt me and, and harm me, and we need protection from it, yeah? So as tribes were developing, they were seeing that there could be battles, right? So my tribe is a, a we, but your tribe, I can't conceptualize that being like me because you're a different tribe than me and you're competing for resources and so we need to be able to win against you if there's going to be a fight because there's going to be a fight because we are all fighting for the limited resources. Yeah, lack of understanding. There's not enough resources and also we don't have the tools and the skills and the technology to conserve resources and all these things. Nature is going all crazy. We don't understand it. So there's lack of resources, there's other tribes that are competing for it, and so as we work together, we're looking for someone to lead us. We want someone to take responsibility for the tribe because we want to be protected. So again, this evolution from we're a tribe, you're a tribe, to we're a tribe and there's a leader, yeah? That was another evolution. We created hierarchy out of the fear-based idea, yeah, that of other and threat, and we can't do this for ourselves. So what happened here is the desire for a leader, right, came out of this childlike consciousness that says there's an other and I don't know what to do about it. If I'm not protected, I'm going to die. And with this, we see the birth of fear of individuality. Yeah, because when we're in a tribe and we have a leader, that leader is there as someone who has authority over us in exchange for the leader providing something for us. So we projected the parent-child relationship onto the tribe. So now the, the, the tribal leader is the dad and he is essentially saying, I'm going to provide resources for you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to I'm going to create structure and order to our society that will create essentially a more successful society. I'm going to make it so that if a, if another tribe comes, we can kill them. Um, I'm going to do all these things for you so that you don't have to take complete responsibility for the whole tribe. However, you're going to have to give me more resources. You're going to have to let me have all the women. You're going to have to let me do all of this because I'm taking more responsibility. So really, the tribal leader was the for most forward thinking part of the tribe. Yeah? He was like, wait, I'm an individual. I can take responsibility for something more than just myself. I can take responsibility for this whole tribe, but that also means that I get more of the resources and I get to survive better. Yes? So within that, because again, we're still at a very low level of consciousness in this tribal life, when we see this tribal leader thing starting to happen, because it was mixed with still so much survival is at stake, the leader of the tribe could not make room for anyone else in the tribe to also think that they were special, to also think that they should have the right to lead, because then they're going to kill me, right? They're going to kill me to take my spot. So it doesn't work for the tribe leader to have a, a group of individuals who feel like they are just as deserving and worthy of, as he is. They need to feel like children. They're, they need to have this concept of him being a provider of something they can't provide for themselves, giving them something they can't give to themselves so that he has top pick of the resources in exchange for providing whatever it is for them that they think that they can't do for themselves. That's how leadership works, right? When someone is in, when we're in a hierarchy, it's always that the person at the top is providing something for the people that they feel like they can't provide for themselves in exchange for a better rate of survival. That's what was happening, okay? So that right there is where we would see the birth of the fear of ego because Literally, in the tribal times, if you were to stand up and be like, well, actually, I'm special too. I'm something too. I'm real. You're a threat to the king. You're a threat to the tribal leader, and they're going to kill you. Literally, the fear of death was put in us way, 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 way back in tribal times. 
of being an individual because literally if you were a threat to the tribal leader, he was just going to kill you because he wanted to stay at the top. And that's how it worked. It was very barbaric, but it was, it was a step in human consciousness. Okay? So that's how that worked. Next, we see the creation of cities and moving forward, nations. So again, oh wait, let's go back a little bit more. And then in the tribal life, we have to talk about one more thing. This is superstition. All right? The spirituality of tribals, of tribal um, groups, was all based around nature because nature was God. Yeah? Nature was, th because we could create concepts and because we could create, uh, we could see ourselves in other things, humans started to project themselves onto nature. And nature was essentially the biggest mom and dad that there was. Nature decided if you lived or died. Just like mom decides if the baby lives or dies by either providing for its needs or not, nature was doing the same thing. So humans started to project themselves onto nature and they were like, okay, well, if I'm the god of the harvest and I'm going to give a good harvest, what would I want in exchange for that? Yeah? And they thought, well, what would I want, right? I want sacrifices. I want people to praise me. I want people to tell me I'm special. I want, I want, this is what I want. This is what I would want. Praise and sacrifice. So they started to praise and sacrifice for nature. These superstitions were all based around a complete misunderstanding of nature, but, but a capacity to start to see some patterns. So then when the ceremony that they did, the praise or whatever it is that they did worked because they got a harvest, it's like, great. Right? We're seeing connections now, or maybe connections don't actually really exist, but we're seeing a connection. I did this ceremony, we got a good harvest, so that was how we praise that nature God, and then they're going to give us our good harvest. And they passed down these stories and these superstitions throughout the tribe and throughout the, the generations as because that was their understanding of nature. That was their understanding of divinity, and divinity was simply the force that was providing for me the mom and dad that was the big mom and dad yeah so that's that kind of spirituality okay next we move into cities and we move into seeing monarchs and we move into so tribal leaders become kings and queens and again and religion you know, myth and superstition become religion so these are evolutions on the theme yes evolutions on the theme of hierarchy, evolutions on the theme of myth and how nature works, and they become more complex, more structured. So now the kings and queens are considered to be divinely appointed to lead. They're, they are ordained by God, yes, which come from these religious or these superstitious roots that have now been developed into more complex religions. And we see also that part of the evolution of religion and then government and unruling, yes, came from an evolution in how many people we needed to control to keep the society functioning. And again, we got to remember, the, the consciousness at this time was still very low. It was still very, very low. So the people who were on top in order to control the masses needed something to keep them from being animalistic because the consciousness level at this time was still quite animalistic. There was still a thing of like, I want a loaf of bread, I'm going to kill my neighbor who bakes the bread for the town so I can steal his bread. But the thing is, then we don't have a bread maker, right? And, and still, the leaders, the kings, the queens, the monarchs didn't want to be overthrown. They didn't want the masses getting upset that they had so much more than everybody else. So they needed something in place that kept people in place. Yeah. And religion and government started to work perfectly for this. So religion was again used, the, these spiritual stories were used as threats. So instead of now, we're just going to kill you if you misbehave, which still happened a lot. There were still lots of beheadings. There were still lots of the monarch murdering people. There was the birth of law and this kind of idea that if we can get people to understand that they're going to be punished if they do something wrong, 
that we can prevent them from doing things wrong. And there was even kind of an idea of reform, right? There was a there was punishment based on your crime that wasn't necessarily just death, as though with this understanding that humans can learn and they can change and they can do better. So this again was the next phase in our evolution. We're still very low consciousness. We still need government and religion to keep us going and to keep us in line. However, we're a little bit smarter now, right? We can and we and we're able to kind of control and have control over larger societies. Next, we come to the Dark Ages. And this was the first like real, true, major, humongous tipping point, okay? So this is where we see that these large tribes and these large communities that we're living in, we needed more technology. We needed more resources. We needed a better way of running the system. Otherwise, we were all getting sick and dying, yeah? So again, we kind of see this like this plague. Literally, there was a plague. So we're watching as people who were holding on to the old system, the old ways of being, the not wanting to evolve, right? That's what was happening there. Because we had people like Galileo, we had people who were coming up with these ideas that were saying, you know, I'm questioning the church, I'm questioning the monarch. Their things that they're saying don't align with reality. That's what an evolution in consciousness is. Galileo was saying, this is reality. It's different than what they're saying. And the reason that the monarch and all these people didn't, not, didn't want him to be spreading these ideas was not because they didn't want people to know, it was because they didn't want people to question their authority, right? Their authority being questioned would lead to chaos in their minds. So they tried to get rid of any idea that was against the church or against the government because that would just lead to revolt. That would lead to people killing the kings and queens because then we're like, you're fake. You're, you don't actually know. You can't actually give us what you're telling us you're going to give us. And so there's this period of time where there's this push, pull, push, pull, push, pull of like, hey, but what they're saying just isn't real. And there was enough of a spread of this information, right, that it got to the consciousness of the people enough that there was a tipping point and a spillover point that caused the Renaissance, okay? And so we move into the Renaissance where literally people are getting into culture, into art, into philosophy, into all these things that were um, in their time way back in the days of Greece, yeah? these ideas and concepts were created then. So th this was literally like quite a few centuries before the Renaissance, but it was almost like these ideas were just way before their time, yeah? Human consciousness couldn't hold Greek, the Greek way of being. It couldn't hold democracy. It couldn't hold these higher ideals and these um, let's build, we didn't have the technology really to support um, everybody being a philosopher and everybody being a scientist and everybody being a high-minded person because then who's gonna work, right? Because someone still had to work because we didn't have the technology to have worked ourselves out of that yet and therefore Greece was taken over by the Roman Empire that was right in line with with the the consciousness of human humanity at the time. Rule, conquer, take over, just keep getting more and more resources, more and more land. And Greece was like, we're not going to fight you. <laughs> there, we don't really have the tools to fight you. We don't really have the army to fight you. And therefore that took over. But the ideas stayed, okay? So they were seeded, they were already planted. And then we started to adopt them again in the Renaissance. And this was a very long period of time, right? So there, there's still kings and queens, still monarchs, still all this stuff. But people are starting, again, to share art, share culture, um, come into something that's a little bit more than just base needs, yeah? So again, massive expansion. Now it's not just 100% about everybody just doing what they can do to, to provide for the survival of the tribe, right? Now it's like, we want a Shakespeare to entertain us because we have time. We want to start exploring some of these ideas and these concepts of humanism and what it means to be a human and emotion and love and, and it's not just survival, yeah? And so this was a very long period of time that we went through where, again, it was like a massive evolution over and over and over again of just 
understanding more understanding more about ourselves understanding more about life survival is getting easier it's getting easier because we're able to control the masses still with with you know laws and governments start to become more and more complex religions become more and more complex all of these things we're keeping people in line with lack of understanding but still they're growing enough that there's evolution happening okay so that's happening goes 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 and that brings us to the industrial revolution right that was basically the next phase and the Industrial Revolution was this massive boom in technology, yeah? Where we finally got to a point where we're like, we can do this. We can kind of conquer the earth. We can, we can make it so that large societies can have their physical needs met. We understand enough about sanitation. We understand enough about farming. We understand enough about, um, we're, we're starting to discover, you know, coal and oil and, and machinery and factories. And we make all this stuff. And again, massive step forward. We're getting ourselves out of the food chain. We're finally totally out of that in the Western world, the developed world. Obviously there are parts of the world that this didn't happen, but we're talking about just the Western world, okay? And so this evolution happens and we, we move into this, again, nations become bigger and more powerful. And so we're getting, through the first world war which sparked a lot of you know uh creativity right because we wanted to win we wanted to to get the most resources so we fought with each other and then we created weapons and did all this stuff and then we're moving through moving through moving through and then we get to the the 20s and the 30s and these are the, like the roaring 20s and roaring 30s and it's like the first time in human history where this massive group of people so not just the people at the top but like all the middle class people too have abundance right this is the first time it's not just the upper class that has more than they need and everyone else is pretty much just scraping by and then there's the poor people that don't have what they need now we have the upper class that's got huge abundance massive way more than they need yeah because of technology the middle class has also worked themselves up to this point of like, what, hey, we can afford stuff too. We now can drink and eat things that we want to eat and travel and have luxurious things. There's luxury now. And it was this, it was kind of like this weird teenager phase that we went through where we were like, whoa, like we finally got the keys to the car and we went nuts, right? And then there was like prohibition because people were being nuts so and, and, and the government wanted to control that and you're getting a little too high on yourselves and this is a little bit out of control. And then World War II happened, yeah? So this might look like a devolution, but again, it was the second major, major, major tipping point just like the Dark Ages were. Because essentially what this did was it showed us with the rise of Hitler and the rise of the, essentially the rise of the authoritarian that now is not just like a king or a queen that just kind of has foot soldiers to keep them in their power. This is someone who now has control over media, has control over all the resources, who can have massive, massive armies of people that don't know where the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. So they can create all this propaganda and all this control and all this lack of information for the people, right? Withholding information from the people, fear, so that they can be better controlled. And with technology and with this still this deep desire to to conquer and, and to have more and more and more and more because you know the point of life is amassing resources, getting power, getting status. We see that with because of technology, this is now totally out of hand. Yeah, that Hitler um, and all the other kind of authoritarian regimes that happened in the um, in Europe at the time was like, whoa, okay, something's got to change. We can't be so isolated. We can't be so nationalistic. Um, and, you know, America had, had been founded and we were trying out democracy in a way over there and things were happening. And, and like I say, right, all this technology, it was the new land, new oil, new resources, a whole new continent of abundance to rape, essentially, was what we were doing, but we were doing it and uh, creating prosperity. We, and then we had this massive war where we, so again, Essentially what this did was took the middle class out of, again, this kind of like, we're at the same level as the leaders now, 
and that's causing some kind of weirdness back down to factory workers, right? We, we need you back in the factory. There's the, there was the economic depression. There was all of these things that kept kind of like put things backwards, but showed us that this is what this technology does in the hands of just nation states who are just out for power for no reason or, you know, for power at all costs. And so by the end of the war, we, we developed these massive alliances. Yeah, these big groups of people that were like, hey, we're not going to let that happen again. We're, we're going to sign treaties with each other. So again, we're moving towards more collectivity, right? We, we went from everyone is another to anyone outside my tribe is another to anyone outside my nation is another to anyone outside my country is another. So now we're like, okay, we can work together because this isolation really doesn't serve humanity and we could really, really end ourselves if we don't do something about this. So that was a massive tipping point. That World War II was, again, the like, you're going to have to grow. Things are going to have to change. You can't just be going and, you know, t taken for yourself and fuck the rest of the world because now we're too technologically advanced that we could ruin everything with that thinking. Yeah? So, so semi-peace was created. The UN was created. We, we, we found a way to say, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to let people in the Western world, we're just going to say, okay, this is America, this is Germany, this is China, this is whatever. We're not going to keep doing this. Yeah? And that was the beginning of the next phase. So what happened after that was the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, right? So the 40s and 50s, we again come back to stability, come back to financial stability. America had made a ton of money off the war. And so... Again, kind of, you know, domestic economy has risen again and factory work in the, in the way that it was used before is kind of becoming obsolete. We're developing now technologies. They kept developing technologies that were working people out of these working jobs. You didn't need to toil the earth so much. And again, prosperity rises. And so that middle class, again, is starting to think like, okay, um, I have all my needs met. I, I, I've reached the American dream, right? I can, I have what I need. I can buy whatever I want. I'm not happy. What's going on here? Because I thought the whole thing was, if I got to this place where I had more than I need, I have abundance, I have resources, I'm not at threat of not surviving anymore, I should be happy. Because we've been told forever, for the entire history of humanity, that survival is one with happiness. And when you can, and when you can promise yourself survival, that you're gonna be happy. But that wasn't happening, right? So then there started to be this massive boom of depression, and the housewives and the men going to psychologists, being like, "I'm having these weird thoughts. I'm having these weird feelings. I'm, I don't like." my life. I don't know myself. I don't know what's going on here. And really what this was, was the beginning of maturity for the human consciousness. Because up until then, we had been feared, right? Lack of information into behaving like adults. So we really need to look at it like this, okay? We had been using fear and manipulation. So lack of understanding. People at the top, didn't let people have information and therefore they were controllable, yeah, as a way of keeping order in the society. We were using, it was a fake structure from the very beginning, right? You can't, so right, morality and you're going to get punished, you're going to go to jail, all of these things, that was the way we knew to control people who couldn't understand consequences of their actions, who couldn't understand uh, larger overarching if I do this it's gonna cause this and if we kill the baker right no one has bread so I, we just it's just punishment and that's exactly what we do for little children who can't understand the consequences of their actions they can't understand the whole big picture there's a point in time in a child's development where punishment reward is necessary because, and maybe not punishment, but definitely reward, and, and, but because their consciousness isn't ready yet to fully understand the concept of if I hurt the dog, it's hurting me, yeah? They don't get that yet. 
they just, that's what I wanted to do right now. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it was the same thing. We were very impulsive and we're moving forward and, and using control and manipulation to control people. And then we reached this tipping point again in the forties and the fifties where we're like, yeah, this isn't working and we're unhappy and we have all these emotions and all this stuff is starting to come up and I don't know what this is. And then this is where we kind of branched off into two different directions. So we had Freudian psychology. Yeah. That represented the old way that this isn't good. <laughs> we don't want people feeling stuff. This is animalistic. This is primal. It's all sexual, right? Cause still filtering everything through a survival basis. And we're seeing, you know, and, and the people who are in power don't want people waking up to this. They don't want them unsatisfied because if they can't, if we can't say, just keep going to your job and then you'll get more and more money and you'll get more and more status and you'll get more and more rich and then you'll be happy. People are trying to discover that didn't work. It wasn't working. It wasn't making them happy. And they're like, shit, we got to keep them doing this because if they abandon it, if the middle class stops doing this whole factory thing and cog in the wheel thing, then we are going to suffer, right? Because again, we're only in this position of power because we're promising to give them something that they can't give themselves. We're promising to give them protection. We're promising to give them jobs. We're promising to give them resources that we're saying, if you, if we weren't here doing this for you, you wouldn't have it. You would be like that poor guy on the street, right? And so people are starting to search for something deeper. They're looking for identity. Yeah. And again, this scary monster of identity comes back in a big way, just like it did at the very beginning in the tribe. It's that if people are going to start to like think for themselves and, and get in touch with their own emotions and realize that it's not stuff that's going to make them happy, the whole system's going to collapse and we don't want that. So we need to find a way to sell people identity. And that's what they did. Yeah. That was the birth of marketing that came that went away from selling you things based on its utility and how long it's going to last you to selling you things based on this is going to define who you are. This is going to give you an identity. This is going to give you a sense of, Oh, this is who I am. This represents me. I get to make the choice whether I drink Coke or Pepsi. I get to make the choice whether I wear this brand or that brand. And this is my identity. They can sell me an identity. However, it's a controlled identity. There's, there's, um, only a few brands, right? There's only, there's only a few things that you can choose. There's trends. There's still this impetus of don't be, be yourself, but not too much. You can sort of express, but in a way that's like completely contained within the system. So we're still being controlled. We're still being manipulated. We're still looking to the outside. Yes, this is the big key here. We're still looking to the outside for now security, protection, resources, and now identity, right? So rather than allowing this to turn us in and say, okay, no, this is a growth opportunity. Um, facing my emotions is a grown up thing to do. Facing my inner turmoil, facing my traumas, facing the things that I've been through where I felt like my power got taken away from me. Yes. And growing those parts of myself, that inner child that didn't actually get developed, but just got feared, right? Manipulated into being an adult. We were all acting like adults, but we weren't right. Instead of that happening, we just bought back into the system and said, okay, you sell me my identity. You make it so that I don't have to think about it. Still, we doubled down on religion. We doubled down on there's an outside threat. We doubled down on all of that. And then we had a little period in there with the sixties and seventies where people tried to break out of it. However, it was unsuccessful because the peace love revolution of the sixties and seventies was not really an evolution. They went from, you know, uh, we're trusting religion and trusting government to fuck that. We're going to trust gurus and these old religions. Yeah. It wasn't actually a shift. It was, or it wasn't actually an evolution. It was just a shift. And then the same thing was that they were protesting war. They were protesting all the things that they, they didn't want to see. However, they didn't have a solution. They weren't ready to take responsibility and be different. They wanted to not have what was happening, but they didn't have an alternative. They didn't think of something new. They weren't taking responsibility. So by the time the love children of the sixties and seventies came to be in power, they just went back to doing what their parents did because they didn't have a solution. They didn't have something different. They didn't have an evolution. They had just said, well, we don't like do what you're doing, but we don't actually have something different. So therefore we can't change it. We we're just going to have to keep doing what we've always done. And so that happened. And now we're here. 
Now we're here in this time where we are at another one of these crazy tipping points, okay? This is the time where we get to decide if we're going to be on a growth cycle or if we're going to be on a death cycle. And we are full on watching the world split into two, okay? So this splitting of the timelines, the new earth, the 3D versus the 5D, the all this stuff, the talk of end times, that all of these concepts are full on true. It's observable, okay? These are not esoteric concepts. These are not things that we have to look in the Bible about or whatever. This is just observable fact, okay? We are watching how anybody, anyone holding on to the old system, anyone that wanted to go back to how it was, I want to hold on to coal, I want to hold on to processed foods, I want to hold on to oil and electricity and all these like ridiculous things that are now, we understand because we have more information, yes, that we now can see are causing degradation. They're no longer causing growth, they're causing degradation. So remember, the coal, the oil, all that stuff had its time and place in history. It was not wrong when we first discovered it. It was an evolution, but now we're seeing the detrimental effects, just like the stress response that we learn now we can see. We don't need it anymore. It's causing detrimental effects because we don't need it. We have consciousness. It's the exact same thing with almost all the systems that are at play right now. We, we are coming to a place where we're going to have to realize the next phase of evolution is unity consciousness. So now we are going from nation yeah, da, 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 to we're one with the earth. We're not different. If we rape her, we don't have anywhere to live, right? That's an evolution. And we get that. We know that. We have that science. Yes? So that's one thing. We need to evolve into like we can't treat our bodies like shit and say we're spiritual people. That's not a thing. If I'm treating anything like shit, we're not evolving. If I want to hold on to the old system, I'm dying. Donald Trump has been in his presidency for a year. He fully represents the old system, right? I, he promised, I'm going to take you back to how it was. I'm going to protect you from the bad guys, and I'm going to get you your coal jobs back, right? He has been able to accomplish nothing because you can't go back. We can't go back. Anything that's the old system is degradation now, and we're watching people die faster than they've ever died before. This is one of the first generations in the longest stretch of human history that we can think of where this generation of people are not going to outlive their parents. The death cycle is going faster now for anyone who's in it than it was before because this is now a devolution. If you're not evolving, if you're not changing, if you're not growing, if you're not going in the new direction, you're dying. You're killing yourself self-sabotaging behavior, anything that you're doing where you can't find health, you can't find happiness, you can't find abundance, that's a death cycle because you're stuck in a system that's no longer serving you and you are now serving it. Yes, it went from being something that did support us to being something where we are now batteries if we're in it. All right, the matrix is real. <laughs> we are a battery in that system and no one is happy. No one, the top people aren't happy, the middle people aren't happy, the poor people aren't happy, no one's happy, okay? And now, the reason that we're not growing is because the next phase of evolution is one that we've never done before, which is that we have to stop looking outside of ourselves for authority. We have to stop pretending like we don't exist and trying to squash the ego because all of these things are exactly what's disempowered us and kept us where we are right now, okay? The true next evolution, where we're going with this, if you want to be a part of the life cycle, the part of the population that doesn't die out, which I, I just genuinely believe we're gonna watch this happen, you need to be taking responsibility for yourself. That's the first thing. You're starting to take responsibility for your emotions. You're taking responsibility for your thoughts. You start to take responsibility for the things that you have been through, that this has been your life. You have been traumatized. You have been abused. You have been victimized. Just like everyone else, 
for the entirety of human history, what are you going to do with it? This is the next evolution. True spirituality needs to evolve <laughs> to teaching people how to take responsibility for themselves, where it's no longer about the guru. It's no longer about a clearing. You're not going to get prayed over and the, no, you need to start to take responsibility for what you've been through, how that has not allowed you to mature your inner child, right? So if you're using morality or fear of punishment, fear of death, fear of, I don't want this bad thing to happen to me and I'm looking for this good thing to happen to me. That's inner child stuff. Okay. That's not ego. That's an immature part of yourself. That's a part of yourself that doesn't understand how the reality works. You're caught in superstition because you don't understand how it works. And therefore you're not taking responsibility for yourself. You're acting on your woundings and your traumas rather than from your ego, which is the divine aspect of God, the, the fractal of God that you represent. Now, what we're seeing is the people who are taking the leap, yeah, who are evolving, are becoming more egoic by the day in the sense that they are becoming more specifically who they are. This is what it means to be in your ego, to mature that inner child, take responsibility for everything that you've been through and what it has made you become, right? You finally get to this place where you say, yes, I was wounded. I was traumatized. People took my power away and all this stuff happened to me while I was a child and while I was an adult, but now I'm an adult and I get to choose what I do with it. So that's the first thing. Evolution of consciousness is not a guarantee. Everyone suffers. Everyone has got their power taken away. Everyone has been suppressed. But now, especially in the Western world, you have all your survival needs met. So the next thing that's gonna happen to you, if you wanna be happy and not depressed, is self-expression. Self-knowledge, self-expression. And the only way that's gonna happen is if you take complete responsibility for what you've been through and say, am I going to allow my experiences to be the reason I stay a child and a victim who never learns to love myself, who never learns who I am, who never learns that this ego that I think is so painful, this thing that makes me different from everybody else and that I'm going to get rejected by society and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that is not an excuse to not become yourself. And I can promise you, you will remain miserable so long as you are rejecting any aspect of yourself. That is what causes us all our pain. It is not the ego itself, the being different that causes us pain or that makes us feel disconnected. It is the rejection of ego. So remembering this, spiritual people, if getting rid of the ego was going to make us happy, everyone would be blissed out because no one is living authentically. No one is embracing who they are. Everyone has been trying to get rid of themselves, either spiritually or materialistically, to fit into the tribe or to be a spiritual person who doesn't have an ego. Everyone's doing the same shit. It's all the same shit, different language, and no one's happy. Everyone's crazy. No one's grown up. No one's an adult. Okay. You will evolve yourself by taking responsibility first for all your wounding. Like I've said a million times in this video already, you take responsibility for your wounding. You take responsibility for what happened to you. And then you say, who am I going to allow this to make me? Am I going to be in my wounding? Or am I going to be a creator? Am I going to rise because of what I went through? Or am I going to allow it to make me a victim for the rest of my life? And am I going to let it be the reason I never learned to love myself? And therefore I'm on a death and destruction cycle, just like everybody else and have to come back and do it again. Or am I going to learn to embrace who I am without outside authority telling me it's okay to do that? Responsibility, taking responsibility for the self. As you do this, you will discover that you no longer live from a place of getting rid of the fear, the things you don't want, or moving towards the things you do want. You start to move from a place of inspiration. This is who I am and this is what I want to create. I'm inspired to do this work. I want you to understand, I make these videos not because I'm afraid for humanity or I'm trying to create a new humanity. I make these videos because I'm inspired to make them. This is fun for me. I like writing blogs because it's fun for me. Uh, that I do it because I like it. It's my reason to get up in the morning. It's inspiration. I don't need anyone to tell me to do it. The, my, I live my life in a very moral way, but I don't have any morals. It's just responsibility. 
I understand that I'm connected to everyone and everything. So when there's a hurricane, I send money because I have it. I am right. We need to understand that it is the spiritual bypassing, especially this like, I'm just going to be working on myself all the time. I'm just going to be fighting, like trying not to have my negative emotions and not to have, and I'm always processing something and I'm always clearing something. It makes us apathetic. It makes us, that's not spirituality. That's now you just have a reason to not care about anyone but yourself. You're not seeing your connection. Okay. When we grow up, we start to see that the more we know ourselves, the more we are connected with everything. And the more we understand our responsibility to everything. And from there, we become true adults. So we need to understand, fear is not the answer. Fear is a lack of the answer. If you want someone to evolve, give them information. If you want to be a part of the next generation, you need to evolve which means you take responsibility for yourself and you become a creator. Create the solutions to the problems that you see. Create the solutions. The people who are doing that are already doing it. They've created the new world. People are living off solar power. People are totally off the grid. People are, have checked out of the system. The system is going to die because it has to. And you don't have to be in any position for when that collapse happens that it hurts you. If you've created the new thing, you've stepped into the new thing, you've evolved, you've taken responsibility for yourself, that won't matter. But if you're holding on to that, it's going down. So you have to change. And this is not about fear. It's just, what do you want to create? What's the world you want to see? Take responsibility. What do you care about? Do that. Because you doing that is your service to the world. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please leave them down below. Like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. This is what love is. This is what's going to get us to evolve. If you want to evolve, change.